So uh, this is Matt Schultz um, with Educopia. Um, and I believe, let me look down the list here. I'm also, yes, joined with um, by Leah Prescott from Georgetown Law Library. Um, uh, Leah and I are both co-chairs for the infrastructure group uh, this year. And um, we, uh, we came back from a brief hiatus, uh, I believe it was in uh, June, um, and uh, have pick back up with uh, topics that folks on the on the call, members of the committee or the interest group have indicated that they're interested in uh, having us cover and invite some guest presenters in to speak with us about. Um, we will uh, revisit towards the end of the call the poll that we put out um, uh, right around the June period of time to solicit some further uh, topics and some uh, votes for the existing topics uh, that we had queued up. Uh, so we'll check in on where that's at. Um, several of you all have um, uh, have voted on topics and have shared topics. Um, so we're interested in circling back around to those. Uh, today, uh, we are joined by Linda Todek, uh, um, the founder and CEO of Digital Bedrock. And uh, Linda is on our coordinating committee for the NDSA and has been in the mix with all of us. Uh, many of you all know her really well. Uh, Linda, I'll give you a chance to um, say hi and give a little bit of bio and background uh, for, for yourself as you we get started here. But you're um, you're helping us to circle back around to a uh, topic that was queued up uh, actually last year um, uh, on exit strategies and migration strategies um, for folks who are who are doing platform work and, and dealing with um, managing digital repositories. Um, so uh, with that, I think, uh, Linda, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And, and this is not a presentation, uh, right? You're just going to be kind of talking us through um, some different scenarios and some different strategies and getting some feedback. Is that right? That's right. There's no, actually, this is going to be more of a discussion, you know, rather than me even guiding anything, just other than just giving prompts. And so just to, like, put some background on this. So, yes, at NDSA, uh, at DigiPres last October, last year, whenever it was, um, you know, it came up during the infrastructure meeting of, hey, let's have, maybe have a conversation on exit strategies, migration, um, because it was also in people's minds about one about deep enfolding, and then you had to migrate your data out of that. And then people were starting to look at cloud storage and what could be some of the difficulties with that and migrating in and out of cloud storage. So um, I presented maybe we should have a conversation on exit strategies. So last month, Matt asked me if I would like lead a discussion on it, and then literally a couple of days later, Sybil said, "Hey, you know, why don't we revisit the good migrations document?" Literally, right then. And so, so Sybil, I'm going to give it over to you and Nathan just to actually talk about the good migrations. We're not going to talk about the good migrations document now. It's main, this is mainly more just to discuss if any of you have experienced or um, having to migrate through any of the different. Um, uh, factors of digital preservation when you have to move from hardware, software, application, providers, whatever, because then that could hopefully then feed some information back into the revision of the good migrations document. So Sybil and Nathan, not to put you on the spot, but I am. If you want to just quickly say something about the good migrations document and, um, well, and what's happening with it, why is it resurrected? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Linda. Um, so the Good Migrations document started, I believe, in 2015. And uh, it was originally drafted, I think, maybe by Trevor Owens. And I was working on it with um, some folks from the Library of Congress and like the original NDSA Library of Congress folks. Um, and it was one of the it, uh, I was co-chair of the infrastructure group at that point um, as the transfer from Library of Congress to um, DLF, the, the whole um, governance of NDSA was kind of shifting from uh, Library of Congress to DLF. And um, we had some guidance from Library of Congress folks during that transition. And this was a product that was started, so this was started in 2015, and we were continuing to work on it. Then um, the transition kind of finalized and the folks I was working on it with um, kind of disappeared into the ether um, during that time. And I had had it in the back of my mind for years as something that would be good to pick up again <clears throat> and kind of get finalized because it was drafted and it, it was pretty solid. Um, the intention of it really is to provide a checklist of things that you do as you are migrating your systems and the um, 
definition of systems is fairly large. Um, so just maybe a month, month and a half ago, um, Nathan actually uh, pinged me and asked what the status of the document was. And I was like, hey, this is an excellent time to pick this back up and um, get it finalized and actually published as a, uh, an actual resource for people to use. And I, I, I can't remember how you came across it, Nathan. I think it was something I found linked from the wiki. Um, I was looking through the wiki for something that I couldn't find and sort of saw this migration checklist link um, while I was looking at it. And it was applicable because um, um, we're possibly looking at implementing a system. So it's sort of migration from file systems, um, but also um, in conversations that um, I'm involved in the Meta Archive Cooperative um, talking about possibly thinking about migrations of technology. And so it just seemed, hey, this looks like it could be useful. What's the deal? Yeah, so we're reviving it um, and hopefully it will be useful. And uh, uh, the current version is there. We have some ideas that um, might drastically change the kind of the layout of it. Um, and we're hoping to actually get those changes worked in within the next couple months and then open it up for a community comment period after that. Um, so that will definitely be an opportunity for folks to uh, provide feedback on it. That's kind of all I have on it, Linda. Since it is linked, I would say if, if anyone, feel free to add comments in, um, right? Because as Sybil said, that it's currently sort of being refreshed and um, might be framed possibly via the levels of preservation. So if people have have thoughts on the current version or like, oh, don't forget, you should include this, right? That'd be great stuff um, as the group is taking a look at it now um, to sort of put out, there will be the official comment period later on, but as you're seeing that now, um, if anything occurs to you. Right. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Sybil. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so basically these, the, bullet, the discussion prompts that are put up here, just to get people thinking about, okay, have you experienced any of these types of migrations? Have you had to exit, you know, a particular strategy for any reason? What were your experiences? What were your considerations that you had to keep in mind for digital preservation? So that's, so it's really going to be a discussion with all of you, not just me talking. Um, so the first, so I kind of broke up the bullets here, the discussion prompts into two categories. One is about storage itself, and one is about digital preservation platforms. Um, so storage is, is just here first, so we can just talk about the storage itself. So there, and I distinguish them between on-prem or on-premise, what you're doing on-site versus if you're using um, another provider or a cloud. So that would be like infrastructure as a service, for example, um, which I have uh, listed for the second one. So if you don't mind, if just to try to keep things, you know, concise here. So for storage migrations, and if you are working with an on-premise uh, storage environment, you know, they all, you know, storage has to get refreshed no matter what. You know, servers, they need to have hard drives that are replaced inside them, solid state drives, things have to get upgraded. LTO generations, if you're using LTO tape for storage or for backup, that has to get refreshed as well. So even if you have like an IT department that's taking care of the actual storage um, migration and refreshing, you have to consider digital preservation in that context too. I mean, that gets into a whole other different conversation which we won't go into about like, how do you talk to your IT department? How do you know what they're doing? Do they understand what they're doing can impact you with digital preservation? Um, so if any of you have gone through this with an on-premise storage migration, what has been your um, involvement in, in, uh, with digital preservation? What were some of the considerations you had to keep in mind so that uh, information about the files wasn't changed, for example? You know, you can copy one file to another, from one storage to another storage and all of a sudden the date can change, you know, on it. So um, what were some of the things that you had to think about while you were doing that just on premise, you know, refreshing? Or actually, have any of you had to go through it? Last fall, we migrated two older Isilon storage appliances into one 
um, but this is, it's centrally managed and administered by our central IT unit. Um, and the libraries have long been, been the biggest sort of Isilon user. Um, and sort of had to force my way into planning conversations in a way um, to, there's, there was a prior attitude, sort of parochial, you know, oh, we'll give you what you need, don't worry, sort of an attitude that we've been working to shift. Um, and so I was able to get at the table and start to plan things um, sort of apart from looking at sort of the architecture of the storage and the organization. And was there anything new in the new system? Because we also had a enterprise active directory that wasn't available before, um, a slightly different version. So we were able to refine um, some of the way the permissions and such work, but the the biggest sort of thing was getting into the weeds with the storage engineers and even um, Dell about the actual transfer method because Isilon runs on um, what is basically a BSD derivative. So it's not quite Linux, but it's Unix like um, some of the same commands don't work, but only the central administrators could could sort of work at it at that level. Um, and previously, when they had moved some files, um, they, they didn't, um, they did it in a way using rsync, which is a transfer tool that can preserve um, attributes and dates about files. But this was too much data to use this rsync. Um, so they actually ended up building a new rack right next to the old one and, and hooking them in together. And Isilon comes with a proprietary data transfer tool that, um, it doesn't work for other things. It's just for the Isilon, but you can have parallel streams and the data is checksummed both the complete and transferred file, but it's also the packets are checksummed as the transfers are moving. So we're able to make sure that um, what did transfer transferred over appropriately. It wasn't as a robust um, solution because really it was very opaque. Um, at least on the consumer side, um, so to speak, is from the libraries. Um, but it was a lot more reassuring because um, we don't have, didn't have a uh, dedicated preservation repository. This was the main content um, through that, that Isilon transfer tool that did do some checks on me. But we had to get ourselves into the conversation which in a big behemoth enterprise the size of Penn State is not always easy. Um, but it, uh, that, was a, that was sort of a game changer in, in being able to bring up digital preservation concerns. Hmm. Great. Okay. Um, thank you. Anybody else have experiences with this? So here at Georgetown Law, um, and I described this in February, so I don't want to um, rehash, but um, we had to move from our university's data center to Google Cloud <clears throat> and forcing ourselves into that conversation was not going to be possible at all levels, but the place that I did was in discussing fixity, which is what I talked about in February. So um, we had a productive conversation with Google about authentication and creating fixity checks and things like that. But in terms of um, dates on files and things like that, uh, I haven't looked recently, but I'm pretty sure we did lose uh, some of those at file attributes when they went to Google Cloud because it just doesn't preserve them. Um, I, I could be remembering wrong, but I'm pretty sure that that's, that's the case. But we, uh, we, it wasn't as if we were going from a preservation system to another preservation system. We're just not, I mean, I was happy to at least address the fixity, but there are definitely, you know, pieces that um, in the future I would want to address in addition to the fixity, but it didn't happen this time. So, uh, Leah, did, did Google say that they could do fixity, or what does that mean? That they would verify the files were okay when they were moved up, or that they would, ongoing over time, conduct fixity checks? 
They do fixity checks con constantly. They do them all the time. And so it wasn't a matter of getting them to do fixity checks. It was a matter of getting access to the, the data that they were already creating. So, um, so for our meeting in February, I, um, I talked a little bit about it, but more than that, the Google engineer uh, came on and talked about what he built in order for us to um, access the fixity data in a way that we could develop reports and things like that. So it was a more, it was no longer a matter of doing the fixity ourselves. It was a matter of accessing the fixity information that Google was already creating, um, which I contend is is sort of where we need to move as a as preservationists and as we work with cloud. Um, providers is that that's what we we kind of have to shift how we think about fixity. Uh, I think in a lot of at, at least at an institution um, of our size at the law center, not the whole university. Um, it, it's it simply was the most efficient way to address the fixity issue. So that's what we did. Um, yeah. So it felt it felt like a win. So, so just to clarify that my notes are right, when, when you say things we should shift how we think about fixity, do you mean that we should trust the vendor to do it, the cloud, as long as we can get the reports? Is, is that what you mean? Yeah, I think that if we, if we have our fixity information before we upload it and we're able to verify the fixity information after it's uploaded and then access it periodically, however often, and and are able to do our own comparisons of the checks without running the fixity ourselves, then yes, I think uh, I think that that and yes, I think that you have to develop a trust relationship with the with the vendor. I don't feel a need anymore to actually run a fixity routine myself if I can get the hashes from Google and the date that it was run and the actions that might have been done because part of this isn't just getting the fixity. Part of the cloud storage solutions are they will do, their systems will do repairs on files totally automatically. So that's part of the trust relationship as well, is trusting the file repair when a, when a discrepancy in the, hash is found. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely a different way of looking at all this. So uh, Leah, I don't know if you see in the chat, uh, this is Matt, uh, Nathan threw in a uh, question. Um, so how often would you verify the fixity yourself? Um, would this be only on transfer uh, in and out or otherwise trust the cloud vendor? So we don't do the fixity ourselves at all at this point on the cloud. There, there's not really a way to do it. However, I should also, part of my other disclaimer is the fact that we don't, we keep on on-prem, we're small enough that we can keep on-prem copies of things. So we use our Fred machine to actually, uh, write things to bare hard drives and put those hard drives in our vault. Um, mostly that's because um, of the cost of retrieving from cold storage. Um, we want, we will use our bare drives to retrieve files before we use the Google uh, cold storage files. Um, but those ideally once we really just started doing this before the world turned upside down. So, I don't really have a, an actual program at the moment for doing fixity on those bare drives, but we definitely will. Um, I don't know how often we will do it. I was doing fixity once a month before when we were still on the universities um, in the data center, but I don't think that I will probably do things once a month. It'll, I just don't have the staff to sort of keep up that kind of activity. 
Uh, it may be more like every four or six months. Um, because honestly, and I think most people will say that they have had the same experience where I really uh, have not seen data corruption or that kind of thing. So I, I'm not seeing anything that makes me concerned enough that I need to do fixity frequently. But I, you know, I still want to do it at, at some in some uh, regular period of time. As far as Google goes, it's a matter, it's not doing fixing myself, it's a matter of running the functions in Google Cloud to extract the views that have the fixity information. And that the plan is to do once a month because that's straightforward. I did have an issue when we got into real production moving of files. I had the functions turned on and it ended up uh, racking up a huge, comparatively speaking, a huge bill. So Google had to go back and take a look at the process and they ended up refunding us um, what we had done because it was sort of a learning thing for them as well. But so now I turn off the function. I don't leave the functions on all the time. I turn them off and then I run them once a month to, to, to do that fixity checking. I, and I don't have all of the reports and routines um, set up yet, which is what I will need to do in order to use that information that I can now get from Google, but one step at a time. So uh, Leah, this, this is Matt. One, one more thing before we move on here. Um, I just want to say, uh, I think what, what you have done uh, with this collaboration with Google is in incredibly important and it's uh, I think just personally speaking I think it's fine that you know you're you're refining um, your processes around all of this and, and your policies um, I just really uh, want to encourage you to make sure to get um, to get updates out you know through this channel and others as time goes by here um, so that um, we can hear more about you know how you're how you're continuing to work with Google on these levels yeah the um the Google engineer that I worked with, he was going to speak, he and I were going to speak, mostly him, uh, at the Library of Congress's storage meeting. Mm. Yep. But of course that has been canceled. So, uh, but some, at some point in time, yeah. Um, Want to make sure that other people are aware of this and, and Google has been very, um, has, has been very good to work with. Uh, compared to trying to get information from Amazon, my experience of trying to get in information from Amazon. So I'm grateful to them for that. Hmm. Yeah, and Carol um, does get a blog post out there too. And yeah, <laughs> yeah we can help yeah. you with that. Yeah. So Leah, just so that I have it right in my notes here, um, how much data um, did you migrate up to Google? Uh, we had uh, I can't say for sure because some of the stuff we actually w was sort of a, in a holdings directory that was stuff that needed to get done that we just addressed before we moved it up to Google. But altogether, we had 42 terabytes. So we're not talking about, you know, petabytes of data. Um, I think probably of the 42, we probably moved maybe 35. So most of it got moved, but uh, not all of it. This is great. I mean, this is a combination of the first bullet and the second item here for when you're also using cloud. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else have anything they'd like to comment on their experiences with uh, on-prem storage migrations? Anyone out there with tape stories? I just, uh, oh, sorry, I just had a follow-up question, not about tape, but about the Google uh, migration. Was that a one-time migration or is that a continuous process? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, it, it was a one-time migration. We will continue to be putting new material up in Google Cloud that will be our, our preservation uh, repository at this point. 
We also um, are doing controlled digital lending uh, and digitizing our general collection books. And those are not going to Google Cloud. Those are actually going, they're staying at the Internet Archive, uh, which is our partner for doing controlled digital lending. So we have, th those are our two cloud storage uh, places at the moment. So one big migration, but now a slow uh, adding to it as we digitize. Okay, great. Yeah, I was gonna uh, uh, answer Nathan's question. At Columbia, we had the third copy of our uh, preservation storage on um, tape at some point, but once we uh, we're up to, uh, I, I believe, 750 terabytes of data. We sort of abandoned the tape because the fixity was impossible to do and it took so long and we are not sure that the tape copy actually matched what we had in our current system, Isilon. So we basically abandoned the third copy when it was on tape. I just learned today that LTO9 is only going to be one generation backwards compatible to eight, and that the LTO consortium will no longer be doing N minus two, it's only going to be N minus one going forward, which is really awful, because what that means is then people either have to hang on to their tape libraries or whatever their drives for their older drives, or they have to do the constant migration. So. Um, so that just makes it a little bit more difficult for people to use tape on-prem, I think. Um, okay, anything else about on-prem storage? Otherwise, we'll go on. So Linda, this this is Matt again. This is just reminding me that uh, back when we had the um, the cloud subgroup running, um, we were right about the point that we um, kind of sunsetted that group and transitioned over uh, to infrastructure. Here, we were set to talk with uh, somebody from IBM on uh, their 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 tape support service, um, and uh, might be worthwhile circling back around to them just to see you know, like how that's, um, how their strategies and how their, their market is, um, is shaking up in the current landscape of things. Um, so I can do that. Um, it might be good to, to have a, um, a talk by one of those folks come in. He was, um, the person that we were working with there was moving to a, a different area of the, the company. Um, but, uh, he was, he was handing batons off and uh, we didn't get a chance to follow up with, uh, with the folks that were replacing him, but, um, we can start the background and connect back up with them. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I just learned this this morning and I had this um, rather stern conversation with my quantum guy mm -hmm. about this because we, we use tape for dark storage and it's like, come on guys. I mean, so we have procedures in place to do all the migrations and everything, but you know, most people don't and, and we do fix these and it's all, I mean, because that's what we do is our bread and butter. But you know, this, this is really, really bad because then, okay, I'm going to go on a little rant here because it's not just like the tape isn't backwards compatible. The drives aren't backwards compatible, not the tape, but the drives aren't. But then the tape library, the resellers, they're not, then it's, they're doing end of life already. So you, they won't support the tape drives or the tape libraries, tape robots that you have to run these even just like two generations back. You know, they'll just stop giving support for it after a while. So it's really, you know, it's not just the tape, it's not just the drives, it's the whole, you know, network of how people use tape. So the way that they're making is that only data centers then can be using tape because you know that that's the dirty secret. All the data centers back up their own stuff just for disaster recovery. They back up your data to tape, even if they say they don't, but they do. But anyway, that was my rant of the day. Um, that was kind of like fresh news to me this morning. Um, okay, so let's 
then move on to the storage migrations exit if you're using an infrastructure service or a cloud. We already kind of talked about cloud. So again, if you are doing that, then, and Leah already talked a bit about the digital preservation considerations and um, moving it up in terms of fixity and also the dates. Um, is there anything else that people would like to um, add to this if you're using infrastructure as a service or cloud? And again, just storage, not the platforms yet. We haven't started talking about platforms yet. Yeah, hi, Linda. Um, this is Eric with Patton over at TDL. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to mention um, a couple of the challenges we've faced with um, a migration of data from um, basically one cloud service at SDSC, uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center, to um, another cloud storage type that they brought online about a year or so ago called Cumulo. Um, I think it's a, it's a little bit of a, uh, a unique situation just because our repository um, actually manages <clears throat> manages files on an individual basis and objects on an individual basis. So um, the, the, the point being that uh, the, the object keys themselves and being able to get to individual files, um, it will it ends up being dependent on the file names themselves. So one of the, one of the issues that we've had to deal with um, during that migration and also now a replication uh, over to Wasabi is, uh, is really these, you know, whether or not um, the key names or the file names are out of the ordinary. Um, in other words, um, are those are those file names like valid UTF-8 byte strings? Are they are they non-ASCII characters? Are they non-Latin characters? Um, so we we fit. You know, we have like we have a little over two thousand of these um, really unique file names sitting around in the system across you know across like you know, tens of thousands of objects. Um, so it was just very important for us to be able to build some testing infrastructure before the migration um, in order to make sure that the new cloud object storage, uh, you know, service that we were going to use actually supported or was able to interpret, um, you know, all of these different characters. Um, and if it was not able to, then what, you know, what might happen to them? <clears throat> So um, we pretty much put together a, a test suite that uh, took, you know, these about uh, 2,300 of these different uh, file names and ran them through and, um, you know, basically caught it, had a sandbox at the new service um, and ran, uh, you know, caught, basically replicated a whole bunch of these objects with these files in them with the odd file names um, back and, you know, up, up to the service and were able to retrieve them and um, if we weren't able to read them properly or um, if we hit any kind of any kind of issues, um, you know, we knew it was actually going to happen. And, and the limitations that we found with, with the Cumulo service were really having to do with non-valid um, UTF-8 byte strings. So um, it would basically disallow using any of those. Um, but it, as long as everything was valid UTF-8, uh, everything seemed to be working well. So um, it was a little more restrictive than AWS S3, um, but not, um, you know, wasn't going to be a real problem for us. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just, it's something to mention if, um, you, if, you, if you do have to deal with this kind of, at this kind of like granular level uh, to keep an eye on, on encoding like that. I hope that wasn't too. Hmm? I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I hope that wasn't like too into the weeds, but it was just like one very pointed thing that we ended up running across. No, not in weeds at all, because it's, it's something when you're doing migration. I mean, there are a couple of things you have to think about migrating between cloud storage, but this is really important before deciding they're going to go with a vendor. You really need to check, you know, can they support your data? Can you get your data out of one? You know, what can it be accepted into the next one? The one you're moving to this. So this is really important. Right, right. Yeah, it was just um, it's pretty much, you know, you like we were going to run across these <clears throat> these file names at some point, 
it was, a, it was you know, the idea of building the test infrastructure and also having the right test data, um, that was just really kind of first, uh, first way to get into it, basically, mm -hmm. or the best way to get into it. Yeah, I think it would be very important once uh, we start getting born digital materials from all over the, the world. Uh, I mean, when the born digital materials come in, you basically don't have any, uh, you, you, you cannot tell donors to check on the uh, unsupported characters. So basically you have no control over the file names or the directory structures that they put the data in. And if it goes directly to AWS, um, I'm not sure how, what, what would be the uh, workflow for the institution before the content goes from the donor to AWS? Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the considerations that we have to take into account. Right. Well, do any of you change file names? Like you say, okay, this is the file name that was received and then, but we had to change it for archiving or preservation purposes, but you keep track of the original? Have any yeah, we do. That? Yeah, uh -huh. at Columbia University we do because we have uh, a lot of born digital materials that we received from the donors with all, uh, with the file characters all over the place. And uh, at some point we found out that if we cannot even copy the content from the hard drives into our Isilon system because of the file characters. Mm -hmm. So we have the program, we, we actually borrowed it from Archimedica. We have the program that runs through the hard drive and substitutes all the uh, special characters with the underscores. Mm -hmm. uh, and we keep, uh, that, that program keeps actually uh, the uh, the log of what the file was file file name was before and after the transformation. We've had to do the same thing. Also, um, we've had to change uh, descriptive metadata file names. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just a, we're we're you know in, in general, whenever an, an ingest into the system fails, we're alerted and we can go and take a look. But yeah, even just recently, we had. Um, uh, a whole slew of new um, objects come into a collection and many of them had backwards slash u as a character, <laughs> as a string of characters in the actual um, local ID. And um, one of our Java processes just broke. <laughs> it was thinking that that was the particular, um, you know, encoding like, like reserved like uh, string and it, we had to basically like create a fix for it. So, yeah. I have a question for people who have migrated to cloud uh, and object storage. Um, are you concerned at all when you're uh, when you're replicating? Do you consider replicating across accounts so you have account level security isolation um, and also storage mediums? Like, do you always maintain a completely separate infrastructure for your backup copies, or are you just backing up in? like an alternate bucket or something in the cloud? For us here at Georgetown, we're the only ones, uh, it, it's, it's all ours as it is. So it's not like we have other things running uh, in this instance, in this, pro, in this Google project, we have the only buckets and things. And then we definitely break it down into uh, various full, you know, various uh, collections and folders and things within Google. I don't know if that's what you were asking or not, but. That's, so it sounds like you have different buckets for different collections. We have different, yes. Well, we have different buckets for different material types. And then <clears throat> within those buckets, uh, we have uh, folders for different collections. So. Um, our manuscripts collection is a bucket, and then within that bucket, we have folders for, <clears throat> and I don't know what the Google uh, equivalent of folder is, but that's the, <clears throat> that's what you're seeing, so, for each collection. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's very helpful. I was also thinking of... Um just like ensuring that we have copies on different storage mediums and potentially if it's, if you're going all cloud in different accounts so that if you are attacked, 
and your primary account is compromised, you don't lose all of your buckets or you don't potentially lose all of your buckets? I think it's a, it's a really good point that gets to the independence of the copies, um, which is an important thing when you're replicating the, to make sure there's some independency there. Um, most cloud providers have a um, identity access management compora part where you could sort of have one parent account and then several um, sub accounts off from there. And that might be one way to um, put air gaps in between the, the backup and your primary copies is that different, uh, different accounts within that identity management system um, access it. Um, it's not quite the same, but AP Trust, which um, is based right now in Amazon, um, there are different keys for so each, each AP Trust member has their own receiving bucket and restoration bucket. Um, our keys don't access the, um, the primary storage. So once it's you know, ingested, it clears out of the receiving bucket and then we can't get directly to the object storage. Um, if we restore it, it goes out to a restoration bucket that we do have content to. So that is, that is um, separated differently. Um, through key management, I believe through that identity and access management um, feature. And what Nathan's talking about um, is not anything that I have gotten into, but I do know there are various strategies in Google for managing uh, keys and access policies and things like that. I just <clears throat> really, I'm probably about the only one who actually does anything with our Google Cloud Storage at this point. I have a couple of staff members, but one is left. So um, sort of managing that kind of thing isn't a huge priority at the moment. Um. All right, so I'm looking, there's 15 minutes left. Actually, Matt, let me ask you, do you need to um, discuss anything else um, in this meeting? So I don't wanna go up to the top of the hour if you have other things you need to do. No, I mean, probably maybe just like a few minutes towards the end, uh, just to make a couple of uh, sort of NDSA wide announcements and then uh, just keep, get people's attention back on the, um, the poll. Um, but this is, this is great. I mean, this is uh, from my perspective, uh, I'd, I'd like to see more of this sort of format uh, taking place for um, for these calls. So carry on. All righty. Um, okay, so let's let's move on because we haven't we've so far just been talking about storage. So let's talk about platforms. So uh, Archivematica was mentioned once already. That's the only platform that's really been mentioned. Um, so what if okay, any things with migrating or exiting out, moving to another system where you're hosting it on premise, so it's not a SaaS environment, you have it on site. So has anybody experienced that? Um, anything, any advice, experiences you can share with the others? Actually, I, I'm just kind of curious. So how many of you actually have your digital preservation system, your platform on site, where you're hosting it on your own servers, you're taking care of it all yourself on site? Or is everybody using a SaaS environment? Whoops, sorry about that. Oh, so, so nobody's doing an on-prem digital preservation? Uh, well, here at Columbia, we have the Archimedica instance. We, we did have it on Isilon um, until last year. Last year, we moved the whole Archimedica instance into AWS in preparation to moving all our storage to AWS. So the Archimedica instance actually runs on AWS and it puts Currently, it puts uh, the output of digital preservation, uh, the apes, back to Isilon. But then when we move to AWS, it will go th uh, from Archimatic on AWS to AWS storage directly. So it's, it's kind of the, you know, the, the mix of on-prem and AWS. 
getting lots of chat about on-site uh, platforms at Ohio State, University of Georgia, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, Texas A&M. Sally um, Burnett mentions a hybrid on-prem and cloud at the Gates Archive. That might be an interesting example. Yeah, hey, this is Sally. It's been a while since I've joined one of these calls. Um, yeah, so I, I'm interested to, we've introduced like, I think probably many folks on this call, cloud storage as um, a component of our digital preservation strategy so that we use Preservica and that's a that's a storage, you know, we, we store both on-prem and in the cloud. Um, but we haven't done a migrate. I'm, I'm assuming Linda by this, uh, by this topic, you, you're sort of thinking of moving from one preservation system product to another. Right, so this is a platform. So as you just mentioned, Preservica and, and um, others have mentioned Archivmatica. So let's say you're in Archivmatica and you want to go to Preservica. You know, is there any problem if it, by moving that you know, platform in, from an on-prem environment versus what would be the difficulty, if any, of moving between platforms in a SaaS environment where they're hosting it or it's being hosted in the cloud? Right, yeah, and we've been, we haven't done that type of you know, we've been Preservica um, all along in our short history. So, but interested to hear about what others have to say about this. So maybe it sounds like, um, you know, as far as the people who are on the call that nobody here has gone through a digital preservation platform, again, we're talking about platform systems that you have, that you're hosting on site, you know, on prem, nobody has gone through that process, at least on the call. Because if not, we'll go into the next one. Um, so what about in a SaaS environment? Like I'm thinking about like um, Deepin, did anybody here go through the Deepin um, I guess, migration. <laughs> I didn't go through, I didn't go through the deep end process, but for um, a consortial um, preservation system, we went from content DM and their dark archive, which uh, ended up being very challenging to um, Preservica. And <clears throat> that was a major production. It took quite a long time. And uh, there was a lot of data munging that had to be done in order to get uh, everything in a state that it could be ingested into Preservica. So um, lots of lots of complexities there. I don't know, even know where to begin. <laughs> I think there was, uh, there's also a group that has been, um, not entirely sure where, I haven't spent any time to sort of catch up with it in recent days, but uh, the group that was working on doing a, um, a bridge between Content DM and Haiku. Um, be interesting to, to see what sort of um, challenges or successes they're having. So, so far, there's, there's only one person on the call who's gone through a digital preservation platform migration, if that's correct. Um, so since you're the only one, can I ask you, uh, when you mentioned that there was a lot of data munging, and I can just imagine that there would have been um, any highlights, we only have a few minutes left, but is there anything that just comes to mind about what was particularly that you um, had to take a lot of care with or took a lot of attention? Uh, one of the, I mean, this, this sounds like it's a conversation from 15 years ago, but one of the issues was that um, 
content DM um, saved its data struct. It saved everything in its metadata record, so including full text of the of we do born we the project preserves born digital legal materials, and so um, OCLC when it did its full text extraction, it actually saved that full text in the metadata record itself, which meant dealing with um, the metadata records was uh, challenging until I could get all of that full text out. Um, also, it saved it in um, qualified Dublin Core and Preservica, at least at the time, um, I had to move it into uh, simple Dublin Core. So there was a lot of data and the goal was to not to, this is all mostly metadata. <clears throat> the goal was not to lose uh, any metadata that wasn't specific to content DM. We didn't care about losing um, some pieces of metadata that really were OCLC's data, but everything else had to be migrated into fields uh, of, for simple Dublin Core. And we used um, data labels to separate out. It was, like I said, this is something that I did a long time ago in other instances. So it feels like something that's a throwback, but <clears throat> it's what was required to get the data into um, into Preservica. It was not pretty at all, and it's still not pretty. <laughs> so it sounds like it was an issue. I mean, what you've described so far is more about dealing with the metadata rather than yeah. with the, the files or the content or anything like that. What one one of the one of the tricky pieces was this consortium um, engaged in this when OCLC was setting up what it called its dark archive. So you had a really horrible process of having to get metadata into WorldCat and then index it out into this dark archive. It was multiple steps. It was, but then in trying to get the, get everything migrated, the files themselves in the dark archive retained their original names, which is what we wanted. But the files that were attached to the metadata in content DM were given just sequential numbers for files. So part of the complexity was matching the metadata from content DM to the files in the dark archive, just using um, just using links in the metadata file. It was just <clears throat> there was a lot of routines and stuff that I needed to write to just combine all of these various pieces to get one set of data that I could migrate to, to Preservica to get, you know, the ingest files. It, like I said, it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but it, it, it was very, very messy. <laughs> can, can you take a look at the notes I just wrote and see if those look accurate? Because what I'm doing is I'm trying to pull out the information people are providing and making it in a general <laughs> sense that we can apply into the, the good migration yeah. document. Yeah, yeah, basically, yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, anything else or Matt, should, should I toss this over to you to close up the meeting? Yeah, uh, sure, Linda. Um, yeah, Linda, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for um, being willing to, you know, queue up these these questions and talk us through this. Um, and it's uh, just incredibly uh, impressed with uh, all the different use cases that people brought forward here. Um, so I'd like, I mean, like I said, I'd love to see these more of these conversations happening, this sort of format taking place um, into the future. Um, Leah and I are going to be getting together uh, tomorrow um, and we'll be uh, meeting again later uh, this month to start queuing up uh, some additional topics. Um, Want to real quick uh, just put the topics forward that um, uh, you all have pushed to the top of the previous list, um, a list that we added to, again, back at the early part of the summer. 
Um, and that we uh, are just going to invite all of you to uh, maybe take the rest of this week to uh, revisit. Um, I'll send the, go ahead and put the link in the, the chat. Um, and we'll send this out after the call here today. If folks can just, you know, if you haven't yet uh, indicated what sort of topics you're interested in, uh, there's room for even to, to propose some additional topics uh, to the list. Feel free to go ahead and do that. Uh, Lee and I will um, start reviewing that uh, in the next couple of weeks and start reaching out to uh, some of you all who are um, regular attendees on the call, uh, folks who have put forward these topics. Um, and uh, if you've just put forward the topic and um, you're not necessarily the person that wants to speak to, to the issue, that's fine. Um, uh, if, if you did put forward the topic and you have some expertise in these areas, don't uh, hesitate to put yourself forward. And if nothing else, do exactly what you know, Linda just did here today, just sort of use this, uh, this footprint of time that we have uh, to have a conversation. Um, so, um, so we'll be doing that in the next uh, couple of weeks. I think the only uh, other thing that, uh, um, <clears throat> oh, you know, yeah, good point, Nathan. I'll go ahead and open up the voting again. I think that did uh, hit the timer and close. Um, so Nathan is just sort of checking the, um, uh, the timing on the, the poll. I think I can open that back up. Uh, so we'll, we'll aim to do that and send this back out on the list. Um, but at, at the very least on the call here, folks can see uh, what's sort of trickling to the, to the top. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just say I'm really, really interested in the, um, the test suites uh, topics and the container uh, computing topics. Those were put forward on one of our recent calls uh, by a couple of um, uh, folks who, who don't normally uh, regularly attend the calls. So uh, some, some fresh uh, perspective. Um, but aside from that, I mean, I think the only announcements that wanted to make sure uh, everybody uh, had in their ears from the NDSA side of things uh, is that we, uh, we just approved the, so the, the coordinating committee and the leadership team just approved two new uh, applications for membership, um, University of Penn Libraries uh, and Preservica. Um, so those are two, two new member additions. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sounds like we're getting a little bit of audio in on from one of the attendees. Um, uh, and then we also just uh, congratulated uh, Brenda Burke. Uh, she is the uh, new from Clemson University. She is the new co-chair along with um, uh, 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 Deb from, uh, from uh, NYU on the uh, content interest group. Um, so though uh, uh, Brenda's going to be taking over for um, for uh, my my previous position as co-chair on content interest group, which will free up my time to work uh, much more closely with uh, Leah and getting things set up for um, for topics and calls the remainder of this year um, on the infrastructure interest group. So looking forward to the next call with everybody. Um, look for the notes, uh, the recording, and we'll send out the poll again uh, after today. And uh, again, Linda, just thanks so much for uh, all your time and and uh, facilitation on today's call. Yep, happy to have done this. Thanks, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for your input. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye-bye.